Hi, um, I'm Christina Herman with the Missionary Oblates, and I'm here to welcome you to our water uh, education session for this afternoon. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, we thought because there was a lot of interest in water and talking to companies about water use, um, and there seemed to be uh, a lot of there was a lot of interest in the AGM in. Uh, further education on specific issues related to water, sort of a way to bring ourselves up to speed so uh, we can be more effective in our company dialogues. Um, we wanted to provide uh, a longer session so we could give both basic and intermediate um, level education on, on issues related to water um, and give us some handles um, to, to talk to companies with. Um, we would love for people to feel comfortable enough with the issues so we can develop some additional leadership in uh, the work on water uh, you know across the board um, i work in the beverage sector but uh, there are a lot of other areas mining um, it, you know every industrial process uses water and it's a, it's an absolutely vital issue um, leslie and a group of people have put together a wonderful um, three and a half hour session for us. And so I'd like to ask her to come up and start us off. Water 101. Uh, you printed out the agenda which we sent around uh, for this session uh, just to give you an overview. Um, this is the, these are the water basics. Um, we're going to cover some of the environmental basics, um, the uh, issues that have to do with water footprinting and uh, corporate water risk, and some uh, just touch briefly on some ideas for engagement. Um, there will also be, following this presentation, a game that we're going to play. Frank is going to be our moderator. And so this is to test how well you listened and retained what was said. So when I, I'm going to, I was going to bring a little bell, but I didn't want to <laughs> look like that guy, you know, on the, the CNN creamer. Um, so I'm just going to go ding, ding, if there's a word that you may be tested on later. Okay. We have prizes. Oh, and we have prizes, that's right. So thanks for the courtesy of uh, the, the dearest quick thinking, we do have prizes. So this is, this is to remind you all at, who were at the June AGM, and for those of you who were not. Um, we had a discussion in the Coca-Cola strategy session about what our goals should be for water. And these are the overall programmatic goals for engagements with companies on water. So first and foremost is safe, drinkable water. Uh, for those of you who are in the New York area, uh, the New York Times has started a, a series uh, called Toxic Water. You can read it on the web. It's very important, and I hope that you will um, uh, take a look at it. Very, very important series. Adequate water supply to support livelihoods, particularly for the poor, and healthy ecosystems on which we all depend. And for specific corporate goals, we called it the ethical water footprint. We're going to talk about what water footprinting is. But it has three parts, policy, recognition of water as a human right, and action in accordance with existing rights to life, health, livelihoods. Practice, those are corporate uh, uh, practices, uh, oh, great, thank you. Uh, operational practices that are consistent with corporate responsibility and good stewardship, very important, of the water commons. And then procedure, procedures that respectfully engage the community in order to secure social and legal license. And we've talked about this before in the context of free prior informed consent, but also once a facility is cited, um, what are their processes for engaging the community? So we're going to go back to, uh, what is this, fourth grade science class? Yes. Uh -huh. so here we go. Okay. Um, first of all, the hydrological cycle, also known as ding ding, the water cycle. <laughs> ding ding. <laughs> it's two things to keep in mind. It is a closed system. There is no more water on Earth today than there was at the creation. All the water we use today 
is just recycled. And it's a dynamic system. You follow these arrows around, you see the water cycle. And as we remember from the oceans, evaporation turns into condensation in the clouds, precipitation, most of it back to the oceans, some of it back to land, and not necessarily in the same place where the water was evaporated from. So there's something called water transport. It goes to another ding, ding, watershed. <laughs> What's a watershed? Watershed is the area, sometimes called a river basin, where the precipitation flows from the mountains to surface water, down into groundwater aquifers, and back ultimately to the ocean. Now, we talk about the freshwater crisis, and it is a crisis because most of the water on Earth is salt water. The cubic uh, storage is a thousand cubic kilometers, so this is really one billion three hundred thirty-five thousand okay uh, cubic kilometers of water that is stored in the oceans, compared to fresh water. And as we all know, unless you're a fish, terrestrial beings all need fresh water. The fresh water, by contrast, is only about three percent of the total of Earth's water, actually less than 3%. <coughs> and of that, 0.5% is accessible to living creatures, plants, animals, insects, everything that's terrestrial. Most of the fresh water is like locked up in the ice caps, polar ice caps, glaciers, mountaintop glaciers. And mountaintop glaciers are the water storage tanks for the world, <coughs> the whole regions of the world. The Himalayas, for example, feed the five critical rivers of Asia. And as global warming melts the glaciers, the populations that depend on this seasonal snow melt are going to have very serious problems. Sorry, I had to make sure I'm getting all the uh, vocabulary words in that you're going to be tested on. So <laughs> let's just see where we are. OK. So the, from the glacial melt, flows down through forests, usually usually mountains at a certain level are forested. And the forests have a very, very important role in the water cycle. They both help to retain water. In places like Haiti that have been deforested, you have horrendous mudslides because there's no vegetation to hold the water onto the hillsides. They also serve to purify water. The whole action of plants as they draw groundwater up through their roots, and some plants are particularly good at this. It's called phytoremediation, plant remediation. They take out certain noxious elements and they help to keep the water clean. In fact, there is now <laughs> ecological water treatment or phytoremediation of water and people are looking at how do we treat uh, uh, drinking water without building large-scale treatment plants. How do we basically preserve water quality so it doesn't need that kind of treatment. So groundwater, ding, 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 was also a reservoir for the Earth's water. But look how it declines, okay? We really are tapping into the precious reserves. Surface water, rivers and lakes, only 178,000 cubic kilometers of water stored in rivers and lakes. And much of that has been diverted into dams. So when you disturb, okay, imagine where that arrow is, you just cut across that flow, you divert it over here to an artificial lake to create hydropower, everything downstream of that point suffers because this water is essential for the ecosystem, not only for the ding ding surface water, but also for the ding ding groundwater because surface water percolates into groundwater. We also have some water that is stored in permafrost, as in the Alaskan tundra, which is also melting. And the permafrost gives structure to the land above it. So as permafrost melts, you get what's called subsidence, the land sinks. And a lot of the uh, Alaskan highways are now getting broken, and there's major capital investment issues there. So let's see, have we gotten all of the terms that you need to know? Um, one of the things when the water percolates from the surface to the groundwater, to the aquifers, it's called recharge. <coughs> ding, ding, recharge. There is natural recharge, 
as when the rain falls, goes to the earth, ends up in the aquifer, it's natural recharge. There is artificial recharge, as when, and let's assume this is not a windmill, but an ding, oil ding, rig. artificial recharge. Ding, ding, artificial recharge. Thank you, dear. She's following. Um, let's assume this is an oil rig. And as they pump out the oil, they are also getting what's called production water, which is very toxic. And rather than treat it and clean it up and put it back into the flow, they re-inject it into ground wells. Mm -hmm. That's artificial recharge. Mm -hmm. And because the aquifers, this is very important, many of our most important aquifers are embedded or encased in stone. This was from the very tumultuous periods of when the earth was in formation and through the ice ages and other meltings and thawings on the planet, some water <coughs> ended up being trapped under the earth in stone encasements. That's what we call fossil water. There since the age of the dinosaurs or before. <laughs> Very often, those kinds of aquifers do not recharge because there is no way to permeate the stone encasement and get back in. Other aquifers may have sand or other more permeable stone around them, and therefore, natural and artificial recharge are possible for those kinds of uh, aquifers. And what happens in the watershed in a normal cycle, when you get regular rainfall, is that you get some rain that, especially when you're talking about hard surfaces like roads or parking lots around buildings, that water, ding ding, is runoff because it cannot permeate the ground. So part of the green building movement is to get new buildings to think about more permeable surfaces, gravel instead of blacktop for uh, uh, driveways and so forth. So I think, are there any questions? Because this is the basis. This is the basis for the work. It's dark, but I don't see anybody. Sing out if you have a question, because it's hard to see from uh, the darker group. So we're talking about a freshwater crisis, global freshwater crisis. Freshwater is being used at a rate double the population growth. So part of the freshwater crisis is population growth. As I said, there is no more fresh water on Earth than there was in the year 1 BC when the human population was estimated to be about 250 million people total on the planet. Today, there are 6 billion people on the planet. And as we move to 2050, population is anticipated to be 9 billion people on the planet. So per capita availability of fresh water is declining. These maps, which were done uh, by the uh, University of Kassel in Germany, uh, show fresh water availability as we project it out to the 2070s. So watch the red areas on the map. It's the 2020s, 2050s, 2070s. Now, fresh water availability, go back. The red is the area of extreme scarcity. I'm pointing to the uh, Saudi Peninsula right now. So that's the desert, Sahara, parts of the American Southwest, but also the Florida Everglades. Extreme water stress in these areas. But the yellow, high stress, are also areas to be very concerned about. And then the gray area, or you can, it's hard for you to see it, but there's yellow and then there's this light green, moderate stress. So at 2020, we're looking at an area of moderate stress, <coughs> increasing high stress going to uh, the 2070s. So as we move forward, and as we think about companies building capital plants, long-lived facilities, uh, uh, utility, an electric power plant, has a 40 to 80 year useful life. Yes. Sing out because I can't see you. A quick question. Is, is there a corresponding map that uh, brings population density and water availability? Together? Actually, this map is, does that. It, it, it takes the uh, water resource <coughs> and then it based oh, okay, on... Okay, so it's per capita. Per capita, exactly. And then based on data from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and some other statistical data, it does these projections going forward. Any other questions? 
So as I mentioned, we are depleting the groundwater, our treasure trove of water. The Ogallala, largest aquifer in the U.S., has been depleted to date at amount equal to the flow of 18 Colorado rivers. How many more years can we continue to do that? Between 1991 and 96, the North China Plains water table dropped a meter and a half each year. A meter and a half. More than half of Europe's cities are exploiting groundwater at unsustainable rates. And in Catalonia, Spain, they have to bring in what they call these water buffaloes, these giant trucks holding water to provide water. This is in a developed country. They have to bring in water. <coughs> Biggest water user, irrigated agriculture, accounts for 70% of water withdrawals. That's what you take out of the ground or from a surface water and 90% of global water consumption. Ding, ding, water consumption. Water is consumed, remember we said it's recycled for the most part, but some water gets consumed. It gets consumed when it evaporates. See all this mist here? Well, much of that water is turning into vapor going up into the clouds, and depending on where you are, what your watershed is like, that water may not fall back in your water table. Some water is consumed in the product when whatever crop this is grows into a fruit, whether it's wheat or tomatoes or what have you, that product has water embedded in it. And when you cultivate, and, and I'm sorry, when you harvest that crop and then ship it halfway around the world, you have shipped the water out of that water table. And the other way that water is consumed is through pollution. You make it unusable. And here we are. This is what we would call a point source for pollution. In the U.S., under the Clean Water Act, we have the NPDES system, which is for permitting point water discharges. In the toxic uh, water report, the uh, uh, article points out that there have been over 500,000 violations of the Clean Water Act, most of which have not been acted upon by the regulatory agencies. So this is a scandal that is crying out for attention, and companies that heretofore have been getting a free ride are going to find that it's going to cost them a bundle. <coughs> so we're going to talk really quickly now about water footprint <coughs> and how we go about the water footprint analysis. So what is a water footprint? And we're going to start with the product, but you can also do water footprint for a business. The three elements, volume of water, time, temporal, and spatial water footprint aspects, and then the type or the source of the water. So volume, that's the easiest, how much water was used in the product and the various steps of the production chain. And one important part of that is what kind of energy was used for that product, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Second, temporal, spatial. Was that water withdrawn during the height of summer, like Coca-Cola in India, when they are going full tilt manufacturing Coke, and all the farmers are trying to water their fields, and everybody wants water because it's hot? So that's a drain at a particularly vulnerable time. Spatial dimension, where did you take it from? Are you growing your crops in Uzbekistan, where the Aral Sea and other water sources have been tapped out, or in southeastern U.S.? which has had a multi-year drought? Those are critical questions because it makes a diff big difference if you're bottling coke in Canada, which is one of the richest per capita water countries, or if you're bottling it in India. And lastly, and this is really key, I'm not gonna go ding ding, but please remember, <laughs> green water, rain water. Forget the evaporated part, just green water, rain water. Blue water, surface or groundwater. Gray water, polluted water. So green rain, blue, surface water, gray, polluted. So this is the virtual water chain. We're going to do this because very many of the companies we work on or with uh, use agricultural products, whether it's the apparel industry, uh, food industry, meat, and so forth. So it starts with the farmer. If you're talking about mining, it starts with the mine. But let's just go with the farmer. So we know agriculture largest water user and consumer. So any company that relies principally on an agricultural product has water risk embedded in its supply chain. Food processor, lots of water goes into the product, into cleaning the plant to meet hygiene standards. 
So if you're a food processor, water is part of your uh, uh, risk that you must manage. Now depending on where we cut this off, if we're only interested in, say, Coca-Cola, we'd stop here. But if you're a retailer, let's say we're interested in Burger King. So Burger King, water risk? What do you think? The beef? The buns? The everything? Water risk. What about Walmart? Where do you see water risk for Walmart? Well, for the food products, yes. Packaging, Packaging yes. <coughs> Cleaning. Cleaning, yes. But when you think about Walmart, Walmart retails a whole lot of products, right? So there may be more than one supplier for the food product, for the gadget that you buy. So what Walmart has started to do is said, we're going to start labeling the products. And you can rest assured that water use and consumption will be very much a part of their green labeling. How will Walmart keep their everyday low prices? By looking for the uh, pro providers, suppliers that have the best water management. So if you want to be on Walmart shelves, you're going to have to get your water management act together. And lastly, consumer, we're not going to talk about that. That's really me. <coughs> if, again, you buy a bottle of Coke, it may have come from a distant watershed, been bottled in another watershed, and now it's in your watershed. So that's the virtual water transfer, water flow, to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Leslie. Yes. What about, uh, what about your sustainable agriculture now using gray water to uh, uh, irrigate in, their crop? Indeed. It's not listed there yet. Well, it, it, it actually is. It says gray water coming back yes. into the system, but in places like Australia, which is experiencing extreme drought, they are using gray water not only to water crops, but also for drinking. By the way, astronauts drink gray water, their own gray water. And ding ding on the gray water. Ding ding, gray water. Oh, thank you, gray water. Okay. So assessing the water footprint of crops and animals, it's, so for a crop, it's the water used divided by the crop yield. For an animal, sum of water fed to the animal in the feed, remember the grain that's fed, different if it's pasture-fed beef, grass, non-irrigated grass, rain-fed grass, so lower water footprint. Cows drink probably the same amount of water unless they're in very hot climates. And servicing, you know, the veterinary care for the animal. Water footprint for the crop or livestock product, distribute the water footprint of the base product over its derived product. So how much feed do you get out of that corn crop? How much coke do you get out of that liter of water? That's where you get the water footprint. So just real quickly, said water footprint of energy matters. These are biofuels, or source stocks, feed stocks for biofuels. And as you can see, the green water footprint, okay? Green water, everybody? Rain. 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 No, green. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, green. Yeah. Green. green water, rain water, thank you. <laughs> and blue water? Surface water. Thank you. Okay. And gray? Um, and no gray here. So this is the water that's going into making, okay, the different biofuels from these crops. Now, here is the water footprint per liter of water into the crop versus per liter of water into the biofuel. So you begin to see the water efficiency or inefficiency of crops. Look at sugar beet, sugar cane versus jatropha. Large water footprint versus what you get out of the particular crop. So if you take this analysis out to other kinds of energy, you will see the water footprint, a, a gigajoule is just a unit of measure for energy. It's how much heat it takes to melt a ton of steel. But anyway, it's just a unit of conversion. So natural gas at the very low end, uh, I'm sorry, at the, uh, well, moderately low end. Uranium, okay, even lower. But I question, did they include uranium mining? I'm not sure about that. And then renewable energy, wind, zero. Biomass energy, 70 and the range is from 10 to 250. So if you're talking to a company that says, oh, we run everything on biodiesel, does that answer the water issue? No. Okay. So footprint, and this will be our wrap up. 
Oh, yes, Barbara? Did you have a question? It, it, does answer, it doesn't answer the water question, but are, are you going to suggest at some point that there are also conflicting ethical issues? Not only ethical, but practical. Yes. Because as much of the literature coming out now is uh, discussing, water is a limiting factor on energy. The water used by a thermoelectric plant, whether it's coal, nuclear, natural gas, is enormous. And given the very high uh, temperatures, heat waves that have, been, have occurred in Europe and what's expected to happen with climate change, we are going to see, as has happened in France, that the power plants can't use the water to cool because the surface temperature is too warm. And then they can't release the water back into the surface water because it's now got heat pollution that will kill the aquatic life. So in, not only in France, but also in Georgia, they had to shut in some of the power plants during the uh, droughts and the heat waves because they couldn't have enough cooling water. So footprint of a business. Total volume of fresh water used directly, that's in operations. Indirectly, that's the supply chain, to run and support the business. We talked about the temporal and spatial dimension, and then the three sources of the water. And for businesses, increasingly, gray water is becoming more and more important. Because as governments say, we have to ration water use, and the rationing mechanism is price, companies are going to have to pay for the water they withdraw not only companies, but farmers and others. So the water footprint of a business, operational footprint, direct water use by the producer for producing, manufacturing, and whatever service activities. Supply chain water footprint is the indirect use. And here we get to the question of boundaries, which is very important. Because if you attribute certain water use to the supplier, you may not attribute it to the operational aspect of the business. That's a complicated issue. We don't have time to discuss it, but just be aware of it. Okay. Business perspective. So reducing the operational footprint is all about water saving in your plant, in your service activities, and so forth. Reducing it in the supply chain, well, what influence do you have over suppliers? If you're Walmart, you've got a lot. Changing to other suppliers, transforming your business model. And for some industries, some sectors, we are going to be talking about transforming the business model. So I don't really have time to get you through all of this. Um, again, this is the same slide we saw before, just with the slightly different uh, uh, additions, supply chain, operational, and so forth. And this is a quick look at the pharmaceutical industry. We've seen this before. But just to point out, this mm -hmm. is total water use. You've got Novartis at this end. You've got Orion Corp. And you've got some Chinese pharmaceutical co uh, companies at this end. But now look at water use divided by sales revenue in the millions. So Novartis is still up here, still got Orion down here, but look at what happened to those Chinese companies. So per unit of sales, their water use is really quite high, higher than companies that you have greater total water use. So total water use doesn't tell you anything. You need to normalize it by production or sales activity. Where do you find this? Those of you who took Paul's session in February, the 10K. Table of contents, item one, business section. That should tell you some things. Risk factors, that should tell you even more. And item seven, management discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operations. Always look at those three sections in addition to anything else. And in the MDNA, what you want to look at forward-looking statements. That's where they're supposed to give you the description of certain risks and uncertainties, known trends and uncertainties like climate change, like water scarcity. So if you've identified water risk for your company and there is nothing in the MDNA, nothing in their business description about water and water risk, that's a company you need to engage. So I'm going to end there. And Frank, over to you for the game. Good job, Leslie. We're going to find out how well you all were paying attention. We're going to play a little uh, vocabulary game here. Uh, for those of you that uh, want more information, there's a glossary of terms that is available to you. Uh, it was part of the uh, packet of the material that was available to you on the website. 
uh, for re ICCR resources, the water session. And that's a very long uh, glossary. But we also have a, uh, a few key words here. So we're going to play a vocabulary game. What I want you to do is shout out the, what, what, the name of the term that is going to be described up here. Oh, Frank, wait one second. Just use the forward button. Okay. Yeah. So, who knows what that is? Recharge. 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 Close. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Artificial recharge, right. Okay. Who said that? Who got artificial? Joellen? Okay. Keeping score. Measure our prizes. Okay. What's this one? Yep, no letters on that one. Water transfer. Yeah. Say it. Okay. Say that loud again. No, I was wrong. <laughs> Did nobody get it? Okay. Effluent. There we go. Over here. Go ahead. Effluent. Christina. Great. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, what's green water then? <laughs> green water. Green water. Now, Aquifer. Water that flows. Groundwater. There we go. Who said groundwater? Who said Barbara. Barbara had groundwater. Okay. Okay. This relates to this. It's groundwater something. Ed, I heard you first. You got it? <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Here. Recharge. Oh, who said Ed it? said it. Ed. Ed, okay. Okay. And I repeated it. <laughs> <laughs> and this one should be easy then. You got that one. That's easy. Recharge. Recharge. That one over there. Steve, I heard you. Okay. <laughs> Say it out loud. Recharge. Recharge. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Recycle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a long one. The important part is. Run off. There we go. <laughs> Base run off. Yeah. Do we have, how many more do we have left? Uh, two more. Save the last one. Okay. Water cycle. Water cycle. Water cycle. Right. Got that. There's one left. Okay, now we've got we've got uh, three gifts. Yeah. And we've got six. So hitters. we'll go like so. This is the playoff. Right. This is the playoff. Oh, oh, right. oh, 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 final. Yeah. No, the final. Yeah. Okay. So it's Joellen, Christina, Barbara, Ed, Steve, O'Neill, Tom, and Karen. For the ready. I'm drowning. <laughs> <laughs> On three. Oh, okay, this is the next one. Shut up. What a shit. She got it. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Yeah, here's another one. I should say that you had the last word. Of the, of the folks who are, so they still have two more gifts. Of uh, the folks who were in the tie, playoff rather, um, what percent of the Earth's water is fresh water? Three percent. Two percent. Less than three. Less than three percent. Oh, yeah. okay. well, I heard it one, two, three. Okay, so we got you two. And, um, have a, can everybody be a winner? No, we only have one more, right? Right. Okay. Um, I have a question. What, what document will tell you whether or not a company is addressing water risk? 10K. 10K. Well, she just got twice. Okay, so we got three, though. Yeah? Okay. Thank you all. Okay. All right. And we have a lot of prizes. Oh, All right, to introduce the next session, I do want you to write down one other word. Uh, I'll have to spell it for you. The word is Tinstoffel. T-I-N-S-T-A-A-F-L. That means there is no such thing as a free lunch anymore. And that's what you're going to find in the whole water environment. Yes. 
just before we move on to the new session, I just wanted to draw attention to a, a, a water issue that's, I think, going to be increasingly important over the next few years, which is uh, hydroelectric dams and the Amazon River Basin. Mm -hmm. The Amazon River Basin is 20% uh, of the river flow in the world, and uh, there are currently some, some mega projects building hydroelectric dams, which is resulting in huge amounts of mercury contamination for the Amazon River, because the Amazon soil very high in mercury, which is volcanic soil, which is locked up in the soil until um, a dam is built and the, and the mercury gets into the, into the water supply. So it's an increase in problem of contaminating uh, huge um, parts of the Amazon buildings. Well, I'll have an opportunity to discuss, so we've got about two and a half, four hours to go on this program. Strategy session. Come right. here. Okay. <clears throat>